familiar guest with us today, Ron uh, Markloff, uh, is a longtime Eastern Pennsylvania guy and a familiar guest to us here. He's director of our association, Venture Church Network, and uh, been in ministry for a few years. A few. Yeah, but business owner and has done a lot of good things, and we're glad to have you. Welcome, uh, Pastor Ron. Thank you, brother. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be back here again. And if you promise not to tell the other 95 churches in the association you belong to, this is one of my very favorite places. And we got some EQ trouble back there, Jay, don't we? Yeah, blame the other guy that's sitting back there with you. Why don't you switch to the pulpit? I came out of my hotel this morning and I noticed it was snowing. And all those of you who want to travel to Punxsutawney after this service and go shoot the groundhog, come with me. Because I, I got to go home and all of this that I hear that, that's coming. It is great to be back here. I, I love coming here. I love this church. But I got to tell you that uh, a couple of people said to me when they greeted me this morning, including uh, Jason and Jeanette, uh, is everything all right? Why are you here? It seems like in the last three years when I've been here, things have not been so good, right? So you all got nervous when you saw me coming in the door and you're wondering, like, everything's fine. You're in your next new season of ministry. Pastor Rob and I talked about, uh, I don't know, two or three months ago when he said, would you come out here on a particular weekend and do a, a leadership teaching time? And so I said, yes, we did that. And we were able to have dinner with uh, Sarah and Pastor Rob and with Chuck and Casey over at their house on Thursday night. And then Friday, we had an evening with the deacons and trustees. We did the same thing again yesterday up until noon. They finally got tired of me and told me to go back to the hotel. I did. I got ready for this morning and here I am. Glad to be here. Um, no, you don't have to clap. Are you kidding me? Stop. Um, my mother would resurrect from the dead and come and slap you all for that. I, I want to talk about something today that is a little bit mysterious. Uh, like, why, why would you preach on this? Let, let me turn around and see if it's on the screen yet. No, it, it isn't. So, Jay, don't, don't put it on the screen yet. Oh, too late. All right, it, it isn't going to hurt. What I want you to do, though, is I want you to think back to when you were a teenager or maybe graduating from high school or graduating from college or in your 20s. I want you to think back to that time when most things in life seemed to work out just fine, and then you slammed into something that was really hard. Maybe it happened in your teen years. It did for me when my family blew up and came apart. It was a really hard time. And uh, those of you who have heard me before, you've heard me reference that my two parents didn't come to faith in Christ till they were older. And they started out really well. And when I was about 12, they started to lose their way. And uh, a couple of addictions popped up and my father lost his business and we lost our home. There would be police reports and blood and courts and prison and all kinds of things that happened before I was 16 and they weren't pretty and maybe some of you came from that kind of a background. I don't apologize anymore for coming from that kind of background. God meant for me to come from that background. But I wonder if for some of you it happened in your teen years where you slammed into something or maybe in your 20s when you slammed into something, or perhaps if you were fortunate and you got into your 30s or 40s before you slammed into something that made you ask this question. So I'm not gonna ask for a raise of hands here today about have you ever run into anything in your life where you said, where is God? But I'll bet you have, if you've got any kind of age on you. If you're using Clairol number 37, like I do in my hair, Probably you have slammed into something in your life by now where you have said, where is God when there is trouble in my life? So now I am going to ask for the raise of hands. How many here have been in that kind of a situation where you wondered that when you were in something that was pretty threatening and pretty hard on you? 
Yeah, that's a lot of us here. Here's the awful truth before we get into things that are better. For those of you who didn't raise your hands because it hasn't happened, it will at some point in your life. It will. After those lumpy times when in my family and at 23 when I married Kathy, and then we had our three girls who today are 44 and 42 and 40. I don't know how they got so old. We sailed right through everything from then on, from those lumpy times in the beginning. And we sailed right through all the time of raising our children. We sailed through our high school years with them, believe it or not. You know all those stories that you hear about teenagers, right? Well, I kind of lived them my own self, but God gave us the grace to be able to raise three really nice daughters, and we didn't have hardly an ounce of trouble when they were in their teen years, and it was terrific. We were youth pastors at the time, so they and all of their buddies hung out at our house, and it was a great time. We look back on that with great fondness, and we patted ourselves in the back for having been such great parents. We got it right. We should write the book. We should do the seminars. We should be the ones collecting all this money for having figured it out and gotten it right, and boy, we had a great time. And then a couple of our kids hit their 20s. And then there was some real trouble that began. And I'm happy to tell you that they came out of that. They recovered their walk and their life of faith, and they've done just fine since then. But there were some very dark days when a couple of them were in their 20s, where we wondered, maybe like some of you parents or grandparents have wondered, are they going to make it? As a parent or grandparent, have you ever had that feeling where you look at your child or your grandchild and you think, oh my goodness, they're standing on the edge of a cliff and they could lose the whole rest of their life. And the boy or the girl that we knew, there were such great little people and teenagers, are we going to lose them? Are they ever going to come back again? And it made us wonder, where is God when there's trouble in our life? Because you see, for those that have been Jesus followers for a while, especially when you've been a Jesus follower for maybe your childhood or your teen years or your 20s and on, there can grow up this idea that if I love and serve God with my whole heart, if I do what he's asked me to do, he will protect me and our family from harm. Our children will be raised and they will rise up and call us blessed and live for Jesus. There will be no evil diseases which crop up in our family. That happens to other people. We got it right because we loved and served Jesus. There will be no bad car accidents which interrupt lives and maybe even take life or harm life. That won't happen in our family. Our children will, will grow up and they'll meet, in our case, great guys and they'll get married. There will be no divorces. We haven't had any. Things will go fine. And we tell ourselves wrongly that it's almost like this contract that we have with God, right? God, we're making a deal with you. We're going to love and serve you with our whole heart and you will bless us and reward us without having any of these bad things happen in life. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but I'll bet you that you have thought that from time to time. I'm seeing some heads nod. Thank you for being brave. And Kathy and I had to sort of unlearn that. And so today we're going to walk through maybe how to unlearn that and to see God in the greater picture the way he sees it. I'm going to offer two examples today. One of them you've heard of, one of them you haven't heard of. And before we get done here today, I hope to answer this question, where is God when there is trouble in my life? So, you know what I think would be a really good idea right now? Can you guess? I think we just stop for a minute and pray and ask God's blessing on me and on you as we consider all these things. Father, we admit that we come as, as limited human beings. We approach you and say, we don't know everything. And things happen to us that make us ask, where are you? And why is this happening like this? We, we thought that if we loved and served you, that 
you would bless us by avoiding all of these really hard things. So all of us here either have wondered this or we are wondering it, and I pray today that we would see both your sovereignty and your love for us in all of these things. We, we need your Holy Spirit to instruct us, and so I'm asking for that now. I'm asking that he would, he would help me as I teach this and help all of us as we listen and we absorb it. May it all be done for the glory of God. And I'm thinking about all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. So the logical place to start when we talk about where is trouble in my life is the most spectacular of all the examples in Scripture. Can you guess who I'm thinking of? Can you guess? The most spectacular example of where is God when things are wrong in my life. This was the most wrong that it could go. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> who? Job, of course, Job. So Jay, if we can see that next screen. This is Job. Job lived before the patriarchs and before all of that. So we're talking over 5,000 years ago. In his time and in his region, he was the richest man on the planet. He was the Elon Musk. He was the Bill Gates. He was the, the guy who had more than anybody. And apparently, he had a very strong faith walk. And so we're, we're going we're gonna to go through some verses here just to kind of recapitulate this whole thing. For a lot of you, this is familiar territory. And for some of you, it, it might be brand new. But we're, we're going we're gonna to read through these first couple of, of um, examples here from Job. So I've set the, the stage. You know that he was among the richest men. He had more than anybody. His family was very blessed. Nothing of any harm ever really came to Job. And he never was in a position where he had to ask what it is I've asked you to wonder about or that I have wondered about. So we'll pick up the story in Job chapter 40. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the peoples of the East. Got it? Got it? All right, how many have noticed that this can't be Job chapter 40? It's got to be more like in the beginning of the chapter. How many noticed that? That's a typo because Mr. Murphy is my ever-present companion, and he jumps into things and wrecks things. This is not Casey's fault for how it went up on the screen, but those of you who were sharp probably noticed that, so you correct that mentally and forgive me for that typo. So here we are with the richest man on the planet at the time in his region, and he has everything. And one day in the story, as it unfolds, Satan, who's walking around looking and watching everything, figuring out how he can goof up God's creation and everybody who lives in it. By the way, he still feels that way. It's been thousands of years since this story, and he's still at work. And worse yet, he has probably several hundred thousand people who work for him, including Mr. Murphy, who comes to church regularly and goofs things up like sound systems, right, Jay? They, they hide in all of that. He has several thousand demons who work for him, and their only job is to goof up what God has created and to drag us down who wish to follow God. And Job was one of those guys. And so Satan one day presents himself before God. I don't know why he has access to the Almighty because he had thrown him out of heaven along with a third of all the angelic beings who agreed with Satan. But one day he's in front of God, and in our next screen, here's what we read. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Now, of course, the Almighty knows what he's been doing, what he's been up to. This is for his benefit. Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. You, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? 
You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Now that, that same Satan, this enemy, he's at work trying to do the same thing for you and to me and to our families. He will not be happy until he gets what he wants. And perhaps shockingly and disappointedly, we see him succeed too often in people's lives where people's lives get wrecked and ruined. And especially people of faith, he has a particular target on all of us, just like he did here with Job. So after this back and forth goes on for a little bit, we see God grant Satan's request. And he says, go ahead, do what you will with him. And it happens in two different occasions. The first time Job loses a lot, but not quite everything and not his health. And he doesn't curse God and die. So Satan comes back and he says, if you would allow me to take his health away from him, he will surely curse you to your face. And God says, okay, go ahead, you'll see. And so now Job loses everything. He loses all of his money. He loses all of his possessions. He loses his family. All of his kids are gathered for a big family dinner and the roof falls in and kills them all. And last of all, Job loses his health. Now he's got nothing and he's sick to the point of death, but he still won't won't curse God and die. His wife encourages him to do that. His wife, that stand-up woman, says to him, Job, stop all this, just curse God and die. Job won't do it. Instead, we have 38 or 39 chapters in the book of Job where there's a conversation going on between God and Job and some three well-intentioned friends who were trying to explain to him why God has done all of these things and their advice is off. It's just off. And there's Job alone struggling for who knows how long, long months, year, two years, I don't know how long, we, it, we are not told. But here's Job left to wonder, why is God doing this? And why is there all this trouble in my life? I have been upright. I have done everything he has asked me to do. See, Job bought into that contract that we make with God. He bought into that, just like we do. God, I've loved you my whole life. I have served my church. I I have tried to do what's right. We paid our taxes. We paid our bills. We raised our children right. Why is all this happening now? I don't understand. Well, That was Job. Interestingly, after 39 chapters of Job wondering all this and getting bad advice from three well-intentioned but off-the-mark friends, when we come to the end of that, what Job finally figures out at the end of the book is, I got to stop arguing with you, God. I have to just stop asking this question because You don't owe me the answer. You are God, you will do what you will do. You have eternal purposes in mind and you have a purpose far greater than I can possibly understand about why I'm in this condition right now. He finally breaks. It took 39 chapters to get there and who knows how many months or years, but he finally breaks, which is exactly what God is after with all of us when we're in deep water, when we're asking where is God when there is this amount of trouble in my life? And for us, the trouble could be any one of a number of things. Maybe you got laid off at work and you didn't see that coming and you have no prospects for the future. Maybe that's you. Maybe one of your children went sideways and now they're in rehabs or they're in a hospital or something else. Maybe there was a horrific car accident where the people in it either died or were paralyzed and they're related to you, or maybe it's you. There's any one of a number of things that can come into our lives where we say, why is all this trouble in my life and where are you, God? Job finally figures it out. He finally figures out some things. And 
This is what he figures out. If we can have that next screen. These were hard lessons for him to learn, and they're going to be hard ones for us to learn too. You know why? Because we have to give up wanting to have answers. I've got a middle daughter who went through some, some struggle in her life and came out the other side believing like this. And once she was in it, you know what she would say to me? She would say, Dad, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God why this and why that and why the other. And I want some answers because I, this is really hard. And you know what I always told her? I said, sweetie, when you get to heaven, you're going to be so dazzled by the majesty and the beauty and the eternality of this God that you've never laid eyes on before and somebody sitting to his right for the first time. You're going to see that in all of its splendor. And everything you thought you were going to ask him is going to go right out of your head. Your face will be on the ground because you're going to be surprised that you're actually in the presence of this kind of majestic, awe-inspiring, all-powerful God. And he has allowed you into his heaven. I had a seminary professor who one time said, men, you're going to be surprised at three things when you hit heaven's shores. You're going to be surprised at who's there. You're also going to be surprised at who's not there. And the third thing you're going to be surprised about is that you're there. So I shared this with my daughter, and eventually she had to learn the same thing Job did. I'm going to read them. The first thing he had to learn that, he, that you see in Job chapter 38 and chapter 40, I am God, you are not. I am sovereign, and I have a plan for your life. It's greater than you can understand, and I don't need to explain myself, by the way. I am the Almighty God. I am the sovereign God. I don't owe you an explanation. We all want one, don't we? We all want the explanation. We figure if God loves us and all this stuff has happened, eventually we'll come to see why. Well, maybe, sometimes. I know people that have gone through some really deep water, and when you come out the other side, you, by aid of the Holy Spirit, you kind of figure out some other reasoning why. But oftentimes you don't. And Job learned that God doesn't owe him an explanation. He is the sovereign God. I'm going to, make, I'm going to circle back and make another point about that in a minute. The second thing that he sees that we all have to see is that God will use our pain to point to our purposes for life. Did you know that? There are things that, that we need to learn that we will only learn with a certain amount of having lived through some awful things. We're, we're not going to learn them any other way. And in that pain and coming out the other side will come moments where God's real purposes for your life will become known and plain to you. Some of the worst things that have happened to all of us when we have gotten out the other side, and whether or not we got an answer for why, God has brought us into a season of our life that we never knew was waiting for us. He brought us into a season where we were actually starting to fulfill His purposes in our lives. I'm getting old now. I'm not old enough to still smack somebody in the back of the head when they're out of line, but I'm getting old now. And I look back over the arc of my life, and some of my worst moments that I look back on and I note that I never really got an answer for, and there have been three or four or five of things like that that have happened. When I see what was waiting for me on the other side, it may not have been better, but it was something I didn't anticipate. I didn't figure out. How many have heard when somebody goes through something really hard, maybe it was said to you when you were going through something hard, or you said it to somebody when they were going through something hard, God has something better for you. Heard that? Have you said that? Stop saying that. Don't listen to that. It may not be better as we appraise it, but it is God's purposes for us. All those Jewish people in Germany that were loaded on the cattle cars and taken east to the camps, was better waiting for them? 
Sometimes it won't be better, but it's going to be God's purpose for us. Sometimes it is better. We can bet that it's going to be different, right? Nod your head so that we're not here until like 1.30. Here's another thing that we see that Job figures out. God is calling us from a bad place of trouble to the open space of freedom. What do I mean by that? When we're in the middle of trouble, we can't see anything but what's right in front of us and trouble. When we finally break and we admit that God is sovereign and that he has the right to do with us what he wishes to do for his eternal purposes, which are unclear to us in that moment and maybe the future moments, when we do and we break and we admit that, there is a freedom that comes with that. You know why? Because we're letting go. How many are old enough to remember the Gregory Peck version of Moby Dick? How many are brave enough to raise your hand? All right, for all those of you who are younger, you can Google this. You can go and probably watch it online. There was a movie made probably 50 years ago now. Gregory Peck was the playing the part of Captain Ahab, and they are hunting the great white whale back in sailing days with ships, back when whale boats were lowered off of large sailing ships to row out and harpoon whales until they died, and then they were dragged back to the ship rowing with one or more of these whale boats back to the ship where the whale was lifted up and rendered right there on the deck and cut apart. And among other things, whale oil was recovered from whales, which is how people heated their houses. What a fascinating detour into history, Pastor Ron. Really good. The point of the movie and the book from which it came is that Captain Ahab became obsessed with chasing this one whale. It was larger than most, and it caused a lot of havoc and he was determined to kill this whale. And he sailed almost the seven seas chasing this whale. And they finally catch up to the whale. They lower the whale boats, they row out, and with their large lances and harpoons, they're lancing this whale. The lances and the harpoons have ropes attached to them back to the whale boats. So they're lancing the whale, and the whale isn't really happy about this. And so he's crushing and beating each whale boat and throwing men into the water. He won't die, he's not gonna go easy. But he's got all these harpoons in him with all these ropes going back to the whale boats. And the end scene of the movie is Captain Ahab in his fury and his obsession with wanting to kill this whale. He's in the water and he climbs up on the whale that has ropes and harpoons in it with his own harpoon and he's trying to kill it from being up on top of the whale. And in all of the thrashing and all of the action, he gets tangled up and wrapped up in all the ropes that were already there from other harpoons and the whale dives deep and he takes Captain Ahab with him. We don't know if the whale lives or dies but we know that Captain Ahab died in his grand obsession to kill the great white whale. Us not understanding or breaking about God's sovereignty in our life is as much as us tying ourselves to a whale that we can never kill, we can never understand, and it's going to drag us deep and it's going to wreck our lives. Job did not do that. It took him a while, but he realized these things. And when he did, there became freedom. And we read in the scripture at the end that God restored to Job almost everything. You know what he never got back? Anybody know what he never got back when God restored a lot of what he had lost? Somebody was mouthing it. I just heard it a little bit. He never got back his children. His children all died. They never came back. But God gave him back much. And in that, Job learned a lot of things. And it's the same lessons for us today. Now, this story is pretty familiar to all of you, including the Captain Ahab detour, right? Yes? P please reassure me that you've heard either story before. Job and Captain Ahab. Good. We will not have to show the movie then after church so that you can get familiar with it. 
All right, that was over 5,100 years ago, probably 5,200 years ago, that these events took place. Now, not only are they good for us today to go back and look at that, but they are the very things that we will have to learn when we run into this level of trouble in our life. How about we get a whole lot more modern? How about we, we get up into more modern times and I offer another illustration, another guy. Maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't. His name is Patrick Capernaum. He lived about 400 years or so after Jesus was here. He was born into a, a middle-class family. His father was a deacon in the church. They had a little bit of money. They didn't live in a palace, but they lived pretty well. Probably not unlike the rest of us, probably middle class, probably uh, being able to go to the Jersey Shore on vacation or wherever else you would want to go. When he was 16 years old, human traffickers grabbed him up from the estate. Human trafficking was going on then like it is now. It's happening now, we believe, on a grander scale than it did then, but the heart of human beings is desperately and deceitfully wicked. And that wickedness was going on then. So he's grabbed up from his home and he's sold into slavery into a foreign country. His slave owner makes him the shepherd of his sheep in distant pastures and only feeds him once a month. He's a slave. He's there to tend to the sheep. He has nothing but the clothes on his back and whatever is dropped off supply-wise once a month. He does this for six years. No shelter. He's living in a country that has four seasons. So in the wintertime, he's got to make whatever shelter he can to live. He's barely above starvation level for six years of his life till he's 22. The, the prime of his youth is spent as a slave taking care of somebody else's sheep. He's a slave. After six years, he finally learned some things while asking God the question of, why is all this trouble in my life? I had a great life. My mom and dad were active in the church and he was a deacon and all this stuff has happened. And in the wondering of all of that over a period of six years, he finds his faith in Jesus because he was raised in something of a religious home. He remembered all the things that he had learned when he was little, maybe like a lot of us do. And in that six-year stretch of time, he finds his faith in Christ. And now, alone on mountain pastures, taking care of sheep with barely enough to even live on, his faith is starting to grow. And after the sixth year, he figures out after all this time how he can get out of there, and he does. He escapes because the master doesn't check up on him all that often, and he goes on a 200-mile journey back to the seacoast of that country in the open country with nothing but the clothes on his back, and he has to try to make it and live. And by God's grace, he does. He gets 200 miles on foot back to a seaport. He talks a ship's captain into taking him back to his country of origin. Captain says, no, what do I care about you? You're, you're a runaway slave. He makes a deal with the captain that he'll work as ship's crew for nothing just to get the ride back to his country. This is sailing ship time. The captain reluctantly agrees, puts him on board ship, takes him back to his home country, but not anywhere near where he lives, and drops him off in the port and says, good luck to you. Now he's got a month or two journey, if he can figure out where he is, to get back to home. Everybody with me so far? You all good? So now he's got a month or two journey that he's got to get back home, and he still has nothing. And he darn near starves in that time. In fact, briefly, he's taken back into captivity by not the very people who first enslaved him, but others like that. He breaks free of that, and he makes it back home. His mom and dad, who were, thought him long dead, are thrilled. Our son is back. So they feed him, 
and they get him healthy again. And his faith is still growing. And in the couple of years that mom is feeding him as much as she can, and dad is making sure that he has what he needs, and they're all trying to recover these six or seven lost years, his faith is growing, and he decides that God is calling him into ministry. So he starts attending the equivalent of what was then seminary or at least a Bible college, and he starts acquiring Bible knowledge more and more. And in a couple of years, he comes back to mom and dad and he says, God has called me to go back to that country and to be a missionary. His mother is distraught. Wouldn't you be? His father said, over my dead body, which is something I would have said if that had happened to my family. No, you're, you're not going anywhere. You didn't hear God's voice at all. You heard that, that was eating the wrong things before you went to bed at night and your mind was upset because your stomach was upset. That was what was going on with you. That, you are not doing that. We lived through this one time where you were dead, we lost you, and now you want to go back there. You want to go back to those very people even, to that region, and you want to bring Jesus to them. Well, God bless you, son. I'm a deacon in the church. Uh, you stay here if you want to be in ministry. You stay here where you grew up and now that you're home and you do that. Wouldn't you feel that way? Would you? I, I would. I would absolutely feel that way. He is undissuaded. He will not rest until he fulfills what he knows God's purpose is after living this horrible, horrible six or seven years of his life where he was on the edge of starvation or actually starving. So he goes back to that country and he starts sharing the gospel. And this is a country that, that had formerly been under Roman control and a lot of the Roman deities were still there. And so they weren't very friendly to his going back to that country, sharing who Jesus really was. But he persists and it's hard and he's been run out of towns. He has a story that goes on for the next 40 years of his ministry life that sounds like the Apostle Paul. He's beaten, he's run out of town, he's vilified, but little by little he's planting churches. He's planting churches and today, after his efforts of 40 years of ministry, let's go to back then, that country that we know as Ireland became converted from Roman paganism and they became part of the early Christian church. Back before there was a, even a Roman Catholic church all organized. This kid who lived on the edge of starvation in unimaginable ways went back to the place that enslaved him and in 40 years of persistent work this whole country we know today as Ireland came to faith in Christ pretty much. Now, did they keep it from A.D. 400 or 500 something till now? Did they keep it? Maybe not so much, but in his time, he fulfilled God's, God's purposes, didn't he? Didn't he? Patrick Calpurnison. So what does Patrick learn? through all of this? Well, we know because we have his writings. You want to see what they are? Jay? Same things Job had to learn. I am God, you are not. I am sovereign and I have the plan for your life and for my creation. So, close your mouth and just accept that. Here's the thing I said I would circle back to. Does anybody know the oldest book of the Bible? Anybody know what that book is? Um, Pastor Rob, you're not allowed to answer this. And probably Mark Poach, you're not allowed to answer it either. Anybody know what the oldest book of the Bible is? I'm, I'm old and I can't hear, say it loud. Job. Job is the oldest recorded book of the Bible. Genesis predates it in terms of what it talks about, right? because we're, we're talking about the creation of the world and the first family. But Job is the first one we have written down that we have. Now, God knew that would happen, right? Nod your head so that we're not here until 1.30.
God knew that that would happen, that Job, the book of Job, would be the first one we would have written. And so the overarching idea of Job is, I am God and you are not. Stop and think about this for a minute. The very first thing God wanted his creation to know that was written down is his great love and his kindness and his mercy and his compassion. And that one day Jesus would come, right? Wrong. The very first thing that God wanted his creation to know that was written down for them to read, I am God and you are not. And it's the hardest thing that we have to come to terms with, isn't it? When we run into these things in our life. Job had to figure it out and it was written down and we have it. And now Patrick Calpurnison is learning the same things. The second thing he had to learn was God will use our pain to point us to our purposes, the purposes God has for our life. And the third thing he had to figure out is God is calling us from a bad place of trouble to the open space of freedom. And here's one more, and we know this because of what Patrick wrote down that we can read today. Even when things go wrong and very wrong, God has a plan, will not leave us, and will use our pain and trouble to accomplish his purposes. All of us in this room have lived through those moments, or you will live through, the, through these moments. And we will be called to learn these same things. Patrick Calpurnison learned them so well and became so famous that on his day of death, March the 17th, A.D. 461, they made a holiday. Think about this. March the 17th, Patrick Calpurnison's death date was noted, and he's been celebrated from then until now. Have you guessed who he is yet? St. Patrick. None other. Now, we have wrecked that by making it all about drinking, and everybody's Irish for that day, and everything is green. All right. We understand how things go awry over the next 1,600 years, right? But the day he died as a 40-year missionary that changed pagan Ireland into Christ followers was noted then. And so this time next week, when all, of, all around us, they're celebrating St. Patrick's Day. And we do too, because I married Kathleen O'Brien. You darn betcha that we celebrate that day. We don't celebrate it like the rest of the world celebrates it. But now you know, don't you? Now you know that you can celebrate it. From this basis, Patrick Calpurnison is a hero of our faith. Which of us could have or would have dared to entertain that idea, let alone ask God if this is what I ought to do with my life. Which, which of us would do that? I don't think I would. Once I got back home, I'd be fine to be there. And probably most of you would too. Or at least as parents, you would be great to have your kid back and you, wouldn't, you would chain him into the attic and slide a plate of food on a plate under the door to make sure he didn't go back and do something like that, but he did. 5,000 years before that, Job learned the same thing. Today, God is calling us to learn the same thing. Because trouble will come in your life. And he's up to something far greater than we understand. He's accomplishing his eternal purposes in the pain of whatever it is you're going through. And it's for his kingdom's sake. And it's not just to make us better. It's to make us fulfilling God's purposes in particular for each one of you and I. In a grand scheme, the purpose we are all are to fulfill <clears throat> is Matthew chapter 28. We are supposed to be making disciples of all those that live here in Washington and seeing them come to faith in Christ and seeing their faith grow so that they can become disciple makers. Jesus is very clear on the mission. That's all of our mission. But in particular, he has a thing that he wants you to live and be and he will bring stuff into our lives that makes us wonder, God, where are you? Well, he's the same place he was with Job. He's the same place he was with Patrick Calpurnison. 
and he'll be in that same place for you too. I have one more screen that I want to share. Something I don't want us to ever forget. These are two passages that kind of sum up where we are today. This is from Ephesians chapter 1. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Even the bad stuff that comes into your life, he intended for that to be. It didn't take him by surprise. It took, took me by surprise when it happened. Maybe you too. Not him. He knew. He decided long before we were ever on the planet, he decided that these things would be in our life in order to accomplish greater purposes for his kingdom than we could understand. So he works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Hard words to live when you're in the middle of it, isn't it? But these are things you have to cling to when you're in the middle of it. Here's another one from Romans chapter 8. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all the creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hang on to that. Hang on to that when you're in the middle of things where you're going, God, where are you and why is this happening? Why, where are you in all this trouble? Hang on to this. I'm old enough now where I can look at you and say, I have learned this, and it is a learned skill. And if you hang on to this, you will come out the other side somehow or other. Maybe the other side is going to be graduating to heaven. Maybe it's that. There will be coming out the other side somehow. Hang on to this and learn those same things that Job had to learn and Patrick Calpurnison had to learn. So this time next week, when wherever you go has green with the shamrocks and the little hats and the leprechauns and all the other things and the green beer and all of the stuff that you're not supposed to be drinking. When you see all of that, you can tell yourself, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I really do know what this, what this date really means. Now you know Patrick Calpurnison. You already knew Job. Now you know Patrick and use all of that for you when you're in this. Is that a deal? Want to do it? Good. So I'll be in somebody else's church next week. I'll think of you when you're here. Pastor, you can remind them what day it is, and we'll all celebrate this sturdy, faithful guy named Patrick Calpurnison. Father, we all wish to have a story like that, and very few of us are going to. We're not going to be able to write our names that large in history, and they won't be marking the date when we were born or when we died. But you have called us all for your eternal purposes into what we are supposed to be and use us in that way. And so when we hit these moments in our life where we don't get it, we don't understand, we wonder where you are, we can look back to these two and we can see that you were there all the time and you had something far greater in mind than whatever the present trouble that they were in or we are in or will be in. We thank you for that assurance. We thank you that you are the God who is sovereign. You are in control. Nothing gets by you. Nothing is a mistake. You're never taking a nap or unavailable. You don't take days off. You have this all figured out and all planned. And so for this church, you have something far greater in mind than what they have lived through in the last two and a half or three years. And I am beginning to see that happening now. I thank you for that, we all do. And I pray for those great things now that are waiting after some dark days earlier in this place. And so would you do that? Would you do it for your own glory and would you do it with the aid and the help of the Holy Spirit in all of us? And again, I'm thinking about all of this and praying all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.